Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're looking at the hardware of the NES. Now at the request of a few viewers, I've decided to put a guide in the episode. A syllabus if you will. Now let's get things started. Now in the last video, we discussed how the NES got its colors and shape. This piece of tech was supposed to be halfway between child's toy and state-of-the-art computer, as Nintendo used design features to try to distinguish it as much as possible from the typical gaming competition. Let's examine the outside a little more closely. The NES is a 10 inch by 8 inch system standing at 3.5 inches tall. The simplistic box like design revels in its two tone smooth gray exterior, highlighted by a single black off center stripe. The stripe flickers off into a fitted slot fixture similar to the rear window slats of a typical 80s supercar. The console's accentual color is a racing red, which boldly states the manufacturer and its purpose. Nintendo didn't simply create a mere game console. This this was a full-on entertainment system, designed to place you in the driver's seat. Underneath that title in the same royal red are the power button and reset button. Alongside it is the power light indicator, also in red. Moving down the system, we come to the uniquely placed sideways controller slots within the black stripe. A simple red 1 and 2 to denote them. On the left side, there is nothing notable to talk about. But moving to the right, however, we see a red and yellow audio and video port. This is an upgrade from the console's Japanese twin, yeah, baby. <laughs> which only output an RF for its original design, RF standing for radio frequency. Note that a console using a single audio part will always have mono sound, meaning that sound will be centralized in a single channel. If instead this was accompanied by a white port, then the sound would be stereophonic, which more closely imitates the real world hearing via the illusion of a multi-directional audible perspective. Nintendo chose to utilize mono this time around in order to upgrade from RF, but decided against using the higher quality, more expensive stereo in order to save cost. Moving around the back, we come across three distinct items. The far right holds the RF connection, radio frequency, which outputs video and audio on one wire, resulting in lower quality than the standard AV cable. Using lower quality might seem counterintuitive to Nintendo's ambitions with the NES, but back in the 70s and 80s, many TVs only had an RF cable as their primary way to connect with other devices. One day I'll explain this in detail, but for now just know that this is designed to work with the radio frequency ranges that take advantage of the TV's internal tuner, which corresponds to either channel 3 or channel 4, as can be seen with the switcher here. Now get ready, because you're going to learn a whole lot in this next section. Here is the AC adapter, which connects to a 9 VAC 1 amp power brick. The first line shows all the inputs the device is taking. Input AC 120V simply refers to the incoming electricity the device is rated to handle. The standard voltage alternating current varies around the world, and in the US, 120 is the standard, while in the UK, it's 240, and in Japan, both 100 and 120 are used. So if you plug a 120 volt into Japan's 100 volt outlet, then your device probably won't get enough juice to work. But if you use a 120 volt in UK's 240 volt, then you might start a fire or get electrocuted. So be careful. This here is the wattage amount. Through some fancy calculations, this essentially determines both the effectiveness of the adapter and the amount of power it funnels effectively into a device. And finally, Hertz. This is how many times a second the device measures the voltage. Though, you would be wrong to think this is uniform throughout the globe. In the United States, we use 60 Hz. But in Europe, 50 is the standard, while nations in the Asian Pacific use either or. But how exactly did this discrepancy occur? What effect does it have on gaming? More importantly, the NES. Well, the standardization, or lack of therefore, occurred when electricity first started entering the homes for widespread use. In the 1950s, NTSC was actually the standard analog television system used in the Americas, which used a 60 Hz signal. Meanwhile, as Western European countries started introducing color television to their own homes, they noticed some issues with it, mainly a color toning disparity and some frequency issues, due to Europe's geographical issues and weather particularities. German electrical engineer Walter Bruch, Walter Bruch, Walter Bruch, Walter Bruch, created the alternative PAL standard at Telefunken, utilizing a 50 Hz signal. Thus, NTSC spread through the Americas, while PAL spread out throughout the European countries. Interestingly enough, the Asian Pacific states actually didn't care for one or the other, so oftentimes they have regulators for 50 and 60 Hz. With modern technology, Hz could easily be standardized across the world. However, as of today, it remains as elusive as having a worldwide measuring system. So why is any of this important? Well, the PAL system runs at 5 6 the speed of an NTSC console. That's around 17% slower. 
game developers saw this issue and proposed a unique solution. The PAL system runs at 50 hertz per second. Nothing could be done about that. However, they could simply make the PAL version of the game run approximately 20% faster so that it would match up with the NTSC console playing the NTSC games. Now, does that mean you can play a PAL game on an NTSC console or vice versa? Well, yes, assuming you can get past the lockout security chip. However, if you play a PAL game, which is already 20% faster than an NTSC game on an NTSC console, then the game will run ridiculously fast, and playing it the other way around makes it super slow. Moving on. Now, if you think the exterior has revealed all its secrets, well, if we flip the console over, we see this little gray box that can be taken off. However, underneath, another plastic piece blocks our path to the hardware. Hmm, we'll have to break it in in order to investigate more closely. But before we do that, it's time for another fun fact. In 1990, Nintendo's popularity had begun to soar, and the strange new stories began to follow suit. March of that year, a quote-unquote Dumbo Desperado, nice name for a criminal, burglarized a home and, after stealing the money, sat down to play Nintendo. Enticed by the game, he played until the owners came home and eventually apprehended him. Check out the full article if you have time. Okay, back to the NES. Disassembly of a console is super easy. Simply unscrew the screws on the bottom and take off the top. Here, we'll get a better look at the cart slot mechanism. This was designed with the intention of differentiating the NES from other video game consoles in an attempt to align it more closely with the look and feel of a VCR. A VCR, if you guys even know what those are anymore, utilizes zero insertion force, essentially meaning it would safely take the tape and play it without damage. NES's attempt to recreate this device resulted in a shoddy emulation at best. You have to manually insert the cart to click it in, and then push down. While new, this works just swimmingly. However, over time the mechanism saw the rise of many issues. For one, pushing down the NES games in the actual slot would mean that the pins would bend over time and be prone to dust. Nintendo's choice of materials also didn't help matters, as they didn't have the clairvoyance of the longevity of the console. The springs were made of nickel, and they would lose their spring over time, making sure that the game wouldn't hold in place anymore. The other materials issue were the pins. They were made of copper, and copper would tarnish easily and rust over time, especially when you blew on it. I know, the age-old trick of blowing into a cart actually makes things worse. If a game doesn't work, it's typically an issue of dust and or a pin connection failure. Simply removing the game and just inserting it again works just as well as blowing, trust me. Using a Q-tip with some isopropyl alcohol to clean the contacts on the game cartridge is a surefire way to keep the contacts clean and ready to go. Back to the console, removing some additional screws will allow us to remove the silly cart slot to unveil the motherboard, which is actually upside down. I honestly was a little surprised by this, as this was the first ever console I'd ever seen to do this, but it will make sense once we flip it over. Ah, beautiful. This motherboard has all the essentials, like a demultiplexer, semiconductors, RAMs, but we'll take a look at the main players first. The CPU and PPU, which are essentially the head honchos around these parts, are the processing units which work together. Funnily enough, the rationale behind using two processing units was that it was more cost efficient to use two 8-bit processing units over one 16-bit. One CPU would be able to run the programs, but could not also generate the pictures required. Thus, Nintendo used a second 8-bit chip called the Picture Processing Unit. The CPU is a 2A03N MOS processor. The chip also served as a PAPU, or Pseudo Audio Processing Unit, which means it created sound in addition to its primary function of acting as the main CPU. The PPU is a 2C02, with its own VRAM. This little guy here is the Lockout Security Chip, or the CIC. I talked about this in the last video, so if you want to learn more, go check it out. Now all these bits and pieces create quite the picture. The NES outputs at 156 by 240 p the CPU runs at a 1.789 MHz, which is NTSC, while the PAL version runs at around 1.77, and the system is capable of producing 16 colors out of a 52 color bank. The system has 2KB of VRAM, 2KB of RAM, 32KB of ROM, and the sound has 5 channels as well, with 2 pulse waves with 4 settings each, 1 tri wave, and a noise generator for percussion, along with a low quality sampler for sound recording. Now, there is one extra glaring thing in this I haven't spoken about. Hmm, what could it be? Oh yeah, 
This thingy. This protruding slot is an expansion module for the system. Remember on the underside of the console where the removable plastic was? Well, in the earliest versions of the console, the underneath plastic was removable with direct access to this expansion port. However, with later revisions, it was permanently covered up. So, what is this thing? Well, the Famicom had 60 pins, whereas this baby has 72. While a few of these pins were used for the lockout security chip, around 8 to 10 of these pins were used to connect to the expansion module. This module was originally intended to allow users to hook the system to various devices, like pianos, cassette players, and even a modem. That's right, this little number was going to attempt to be the first home sleeper agent into the online world. On Japan's Famicom internet service, one could trade stocks, access the bank, shop, buy tickets, and more. There were approximately 130,000 users in its heyday, but not many people took it seriously and opted for real computers instead. Thus, Nintendo's internet service never got off the ground, but the capability is still there. Okay, last comment on the motherboard before we wrap things up. In the middle, there is a code which refers to the revision of the NES. This one happens to be the NES CPU 07, and as I understand it, there are 8 versions from 04 to 11. From what I can tell, nobody knows the difference between any of them. I've done my research, I've scoured the forums, I've even asked the geeks at my local game corner, and no one has any idea about this. From what I understand though, each revision at least improved the lockout security chip to make sure that sketchier games or illegal games couldn't be played on the console. If you have an early edition like the O4, it can probably play anything, but some of the later ones like 9, 10, and 11 will probably lock out some of the weirder games out there. Hey, this is a late add-on to the NES video. It's like 4 a.m., so forgive me. I'm literally going to publish this tomorrow. I found out through some forums, which I totally forgot the name of. I'll post them down below. That there were additional two revisions on top of revisions 4 through 11 for the NES. Apparently, revision 2 was the initial USA test market. That means they only released like 10,000 of these to the New York market. Apparently, it may have been 50,000, but these things are hard to find. If you can find one, then good job. That's in incredible. Now revision 3, no one has any information on. Now I theorized that could be a later test market designed for California and New Jersey, but those were kind of lost amidst the bigger national release, which was revisions 4 through revisions 11. And that's pretty much it for the NES console, however we're not quite done with the hardware. Oh no. In fact, the cartridges have hardware that's just as important, if not more so, than the entire console. So be sure to take a look at that in our next episode in the game section. Until then, this is Brando, signing out. While the option plays, look at these really cool NES consoles from all around the world. And of course, do the normal stuff, like, share, and subscribe. Thanks guys!